see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, I'm Edwin Rutsch, and this is Dialogues on How to Build a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with Jonathan Barron. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, for uh, joining me. Thank you. And uh, just by way of uh, introduction, um, you're a professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, and you study how people think about uh, moral questions, uh, especially the questions about uh, pu public policy. Um, right. Is there more you'd like to add, you know, just in way of uh, introducing yourself? No, it'll, it'll become clear when, when we talk. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, the reason uh, I got connected with you was is there's an article uh, in the New Yorker, in the May edition of the New Yorker, and it was titled The Baby in the Well, The Case Against uh, Empathy, and it was by uh, Paul Bloom. And uh, in the uh, article, uh, he actually uh, referenced you, So, and uh, a study that you and Ilana Rittoff, Rittoff yeah. had done. And uh, so what I want to do is just, you know, talk about uh, about your study and, and kind of the how you, if you feel, that what it had to do with empathy and, you know, did, uh, you know, how uh, Paul Bloom, you know, referenced it. Do you feel that's accurate or if you have something to add uh, to, to that? Yeah, it was roughly accurate. I mean, he got the main point. And I, I have to say first that I really liked his article. I agreed with it totally, almost totally. There were a couple of minor points where I disagreed, and they and it's it. This is really he was hitting on the theme of of what my own work has been about for about twenty years at least, and more than that actually, and the, which is that. When we think about big moral questions or political questions, uh, we need to take into account everyone who's affected and the consequences for those people. And there's a lot of uh, biases that get in the way uh, where if we, that prevent us from doing that. And one of them is what he was referring to by empathy, as empathy, although I, the way he used that word is, is somewhat unusual, but uh, I, I, learned, I, I watched some of the uh, interview, your interview with Batson, and he spent a long time discussing the definition of empathy. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew what it was, but after listening to him, now I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little bit of my experience, too. Is I, he has like eight ways of using the term, and I felt more confused after I'd listened to it than, uh, than when well, it I began. He got, it gets pretty subtle. It wasn't that he was... Um, that I felt confused. It just, I had, I had been making a sharp distinction between empathy and sympathy. And he pointed out that historically in social psychology, empathy was used to cover both because sympathy sounded condescending. <laughs> I never thought of that, but I guess it does. <laughs> so, but to me, empathy, well, anyway. So well, one thing I wanted to say is, you know, the, you looked at it, the interview uh, on my uh, website, which is a center for building a culture of empathy. And so I'm kind of I'm coming from the point of view that we need to foster more empathy in the world. And uh, so Paul Bloom is saying, well, empathy has these, uh, you know, problems that he's seeing. And what I was hearing from you is that you're kind of agreeing with him that there are some yes. kind of problems with empathy and that uh, you kind of agree with him uh, in uh, in kind of what you were hearing from because it's it's very well, so okay the the distinction I make is between empathy and sympathy, but also within each one you could talk about two kinds of empathy or sympathy. One is you might call local, uh, which is like the person right in front of your nose, the beggar who's asking you for money, uh, the uh, your your relative who's sick. Uh, uh, the person in the news article who's who's portrayed as the example of someone suffering, uh, and but then there's you could also talk about extended sympathy or empathy, which is thinking about the great masses of people throughout the world, both now and in the future, mm -hmm. who are affected by some policy, and it's it's the latter, in my view, that we have far too little of. And sometimes the local empathy gets in the way. So that 
we see people giving to charities of um, or helping individual people or giving to local charities which is all very nice and it's certainly better that they do that than not do that but meanwhile they neglect the really really easy things they could do uh, to help those you know the, the the great masses of people who are suffering now and who will suffer in the future if we don't do things that we ought to be doing and most of that is expressed too, through politics and mm -hmm. about the easy things I'm talking about voting you know that that's much easier than giving money for most for most Americans anyway uh -huh. and when we vote we tend to ignore the uh, policies and also polit participate politically, we tend to ignore those policies that really matter for those people. So, uh, so where I'm coming from is that, uh, and I'll get to the article that Paul Bloom cited, but okay. basically I'm um, a utilitarian, and I, uh, that's a moral philosophy which says that when we have choices to make that affect other people, uh, we should make them so as to do the most good, total, period. And we're gonna, and that means we're gonna have to make trade-offs. That is, some policies will help some people and hurt others, and we have to decide whether the benefit is greater than the costs. Okay. Uh, well, let me just uh, kind of rephrase what what I'm hearing so far. Is that you're seeing a difference between empathy and sympathy, and that empathy breaks down into uh, a kind of a direct empathy, and then there's an extended empathy, and the extended empathy kind of overlaps uh, with politics, that we kind of look at the, you know, how, how uh, other, others in society and in the future will be affected. Uh, well, okay, for, yeah, but, um, but the, the thing is, I think the, the distinction I make between empathy and sympathy is that empathy is a feeling you get that it resonates with, a per, with another person, usually a person who's suffering. There's, um, sympathy is more like an understanding of what that other person's going to and a real going through and a realization of its implications for for decision making it doesn't require feeling and it i think but i'm not sure and actually have no data on this that th that sympathy is easier to extend than empathy that is when i think about people you know dying of malnutrition in India or Africa. I, I don't really feel empathy. I, I don't have a, an emotional feeling that's like what they must have. But I do understand the feeling that they're having and wish it would go away and wish we could do something about it. Uh, so that's what's required for utilitarian thinking and understanding of other people's positions but it doesn't require literally empathy in the narrow sense. I, it's not like I never feel empathy, but it has to be something that's really, really hits home in a certain way. Um, like, I, th I was trying to think for this interview the last time I actually felt empathy. And it was when I read about the bombing in, at the Boston Marathon and uh, was empathizing, and, and since I run myself, I. I was empathizing, I was imagining what it was like to finish a marathon and have your legs blown off. And that was just, I, it, I was almost feeling the pain. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I mean by empathy. Mm -hmm. but, um, but if I act on that, that that's going to make me act in a narrow way. And, and so what Bloom was saying was that empathy tends to be enumerate. It doesn't take to, into account numbers. It doesn't consider long-term consequences. It only looks at short-term consequences. And so what we need to be doing is, I think, is to, is to take into account the effects of our actions, including our political actions, on people now and the future, including people we don't know, people on the other side of the world, people who are very different from us so that we can't really put ourselves in a position that easily except to understand uh, what's bothering them. So, the, um, I, I don't know if that's a little clearer, but. Um, yeah, well, there's one thing is, is like with the interview with Dan Batson, it, it there's uh, these words get used quite differently, and, you know, and uh, there's still a lot of, uh, I, 
you know, there's a lot of uh, confusion about how, you know, what the words mean and, and in different aspects. I mean, Dan Batson lays out like eight wa ways that at oh. least that people, you know, that the word is used. And then he says there could even be more. So um, what I was hearing is that there's kind of that direct empathy is what I'm hearing, which is kind of, where you, and then there's that uh, sort of an imagined uh, empathy that you were imagining what it was like uh, for the, the bomber, you know, for people who have yeah. run that no, bombing. That, that, um, that's, that was direct empathy. Oh, that was direct, you were saying that as direct empathy. And that's local uh -huh. in the sense that it's a particular person at a particular time. Uh, but and in any case, what we need to do is, is sympathize with people who are unlike ourselves. And let me, let me just give you an example of a conversation I had that might help make this clear, mm -hmm. of someone who could not sympathize, was incapable of it. Um, there was this uh, uh, rich friend of my mother's. This happened many years ago. He's probably dead now. Um, a, a rich friend of, of my mother's, and we were arguing politics. And, and I was he was arguing that um, the state, the government doesn't need to help the poor. And I was arguing the other side, that it, that it should help the poor. So I, I, gave him a, I gave him an example. I said, all right, look, you came, you came up here through the city. There was a beggar on the corner. Uh, he was down and out. Um, he, I, I mean, how, how did he wind up there? You know, we, we don't know. But what I'm saying is we should help people like that. Now, let, let me, let, let's imagine a situation that I'm going to flip a coin. And if it's heads, everything stays as, it, as they are, as it is. Everything's, if, if it's tails, you and he switch places completely. You become complete. You become him and he becomes you completely. So you take on his character um, and his personality, his emotions, his desires. Now, before I flip the coin, I want you to just decide about what the government policy should be. And I was thinking if he, you know, that is, are you, if it, under one policy things stay as they are, under the other policy you're going to pay <clears throat> another hundred dollars in taxes and we're going to take care of him. And uh, the guy said to me, uh, well, you know, I, um, if, 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 I, if that happened, if we switched places so that I were him, I would pull myself up by, by my bootstraps. I would become what I am now. Th this was a guy who couldn't, have, who couldn't sympathize. He couldn't imagine what it would, what was like to be not very well educated, probably genetically low IQ, uh, probably had terrible, unlucky experiences in life, uh, and that could just not, and probably poor health. Uh, all of these things would make it impossible uh, to, for him to pull himself up by his bootstraps. But the guy, the guy I was talking to could not put himself in that position. That's what I mean by sympathize. Oh, okay. He didn't have to uh -huh. feel he didn't have to feel it. He had to be able to understand what it was like, and he was failing to be able to do that. And I think that's what's happening now a lot in politics. There are. So anyway, getting yeah, back if I can just reflect what I'm hearing here on the, if you're saying that this person, this this friend of yours, you're you're talking and you're asking him to imagine himself to be in the position of this person who is is homeless. And, and, he to, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't put himself in that person's, uh, you know, f frame of reference or just imagine what it would be like. Um, yeah. And you're calling that uh, sympathy. Lack of sympathy. Oh, lack of empathy. Yeah, he's, he's not sympathizing. Well, there seems to be, uh, I mean, in the, you know, usually, well, when I did the interview with Dan Batson, he said, you know, when you first start off with a discussion, uh, you know, lay out your definitions and stick to them. So maybe I'll just quickly just say my definition of empathy, that there's uh, one part which is kind of a mirrored empathy through mirror neurons, that when we, you know, see an action and do an action, that the same neurons, you know, fire. So that we experience, you know, the experience of others through this uh, mirrored, uh, sort of a mirrored empathy. And then there's a kind of an extended empathy 
which which I think that you're calling sympathy, which for me would be actually like an extended empathy, where I can actually do role playing and imagine if I was that person, you know, on the street, you know, what would come up within me, you know, from my own feelings, my own experience, what is the sensations, what is the personal experience that I would have and to be able to speak from that. And I, you know, I've done kind of role playing, like actors do that. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that extreme. As uh -huh. being, yeah. Just to understand. In any case, to, to come back to that thing in the article that Bloom cited, there was a study I did with Elena Ritov. Um, so what my research has mostly been, been about is showing ways in which people are not utilitarian. And that was one of them, and not a, perhaps not a particularly interesting one, but that article has been very influential. And that is even, even Paul Bloom has read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, uh, what we were interested in was tort law. Uh, now, the, from a from utilitarian point of view, from Bentham knew this, that the point of tort law is, is to punish people for being careless in ways that hurt others. And by punishing them, we prevent others in the future from doing those same things. So, you know, if somebody sues uh, um, Boeing because their battery catches fire, because they're injured, that and, and wins the suit, then Boeing knows that if it wants to avoid future lawsuits, it has to fix the batteries. And so do all the other airplane manufacturers. Uh, and that's, that's the point of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. oh, just one, maybe I can just quickly read this section that uh, Paul wrote. He says, uh, on many issues, empathy can pull us in the wrong direction. And then he gives, uh, you know, your study as an example. He says, but the appetite for retribution is typically indifferent to long-term consequences. In one study uh, conducted by Jonathan Barron and Ilana Ritoff, people were asked how best to punish a company for producing a vaccine that caused the death of a child. Some were told that a higher fine would make the company work harder to manufacture a safer product. Others were told that a higher fine would discourage the company from making the vaccine. And since there were no applicable, applicable alternatives on the market, the punishment would lead to more deaths. Most people didn't care. They wanted the company fined heavily, whatever the consequences. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a good summary. So okay. the, the, point, the point was that people are not thinking about the long-term consequences, and they are thinking about the case right in front of them, namely the, uh, the, the, the uh, well, I think it was... Uh, Let's see, it was a vaccine caused, okay, it caused a death. We had two cases. One was a vaccine and the other was a birth control pill. And based on real life, this, these things really happen. Mm -hmm. And uh, th so they wanted to find the company because the, to compensate for the person who was hurt, even if the person was dead. Uh, so the, in, in other words, they wanted to sort of balance the scale. Mm-hmm. And possibly because they did have empathy for that person who was described in the case, but didn't think at all about the long-term consequences of a lawsuit that would, in fact, have the wrong effect. That is, what th this actually happened in the 1970s, that uh, vaccine companies were getting sued for uh, side effects that were inevitable. They, they weren't making a mistake in making the vaccine. It just, you couldn't make a better vaccine. And the, the pertussis vaccine, the DPT vaccine, had side effects that sometimes caused very serious damage or possibly even death. And, but on the whole, that vaccine was wildly beneficial. It was saving tens of thousands of lives per year in the United States. And, uh, it, and the sacrifice was maybe two or three. Uh, but the vaccine companies were losing so many lawsuits that one by one they dropped out from making the vaccine. So what in the end, there, there was only one company left and it was threatening to, to, to drop out of business and Congress stepped in and, and passed this vaccine injury law that, mm -hmm. uh, that fixed it, fixed the problem. Uh, but so, th so we were basing it on a real case where 
companies were getting sued because of sympathy or empathy for the victims, uh, but not because of the long-term consequences of it, which were exactly bad. Uh, you had people dropping out of the market. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that the uh, people were empathizing with uh, the people, that, that whoever was harmed by this uh, vaccine, yes. but that they weren't really put, uh, empathizing maybe with the manufacturer as well as uh, people well, who would be benefiting from future back vaccines in the, in the future. Well, indeed, people who would be benefiting. That's the critical thing. Uh -huh. uh, that because, you know, so, uh, so, that, so that was sort of a good example. The other thing mm. that, that Bloom didn't say was that we designed the cases so that they were absolutely clear that the, case, the, the, the company wasn't negligent. So <laughs> that is uh, probably in a court of law with cross-examination on both sides, the company would have not had to pay anything. Mm -hmm. Because they, we said they, they made it, it was made according to the specifications. Uh, they had tested it before. They found certain side effects. They reported all those side effects in the package insert. They had never observed this one. So they were being completely honest, and they did the required testing, uh, and they made the vaccine to specification, and it still caused deaths. Mm hmm so it sounds like the, uh, the, the manufacturer is actually trying to uh, do due diligence and they were kind of obeying the regulations and the law and had like a, a positive intention. And right. that, uh, and that the, what happened is that uh, the uh, people who were judging this were actually not hearing that, that they were kind of just jumping to conclusions, yes. kind of That's wanting more. retribution, they wanted punishment. And, and they wanted to help the victim. Oh, they wanted to help the victim. Uh -huh. But we took that out of it. We told them that the company would pay a fine to the government, and the government would compensate the victim whether the company paid a fine or not. Uh, that's actually the system they have in, uh, in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the compensation and penalties are separated. So it, 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 we even took the victim out. Mm. And they still did that. But... When you were doing your study, were you actually looking at empathy, the role of empathy within this, or was it what was was that actually kind of a factor as you were looking at? No, in in a lot of studies we have done that, but we haven't. We didn't do it in that one. Uh, that is, uh, Ilana is much more interested in emotion than I am. I see. And, uh, so in other studies we've done, we've always asked people, you know, how, how sympathetic are you, or how angry are you. Um, and things like that, but we didn't do that in this one. Oh. Well, maybe what I'm trying to understand, I, I understand is... Um, I will say, I will oh, say that there's more? In, yeah, well, in okay. recent studies, um, we've found that people who... Th this is unpublished. I'm doing these with Mary Frances Luce, and we're actually kind of a little surprised by some of our results. Um, the... Uh, we found that we have a measure of sympathy and a measure of empathy as personality traits. And what we find is that these measures correlate positively with utilitarian solutions. That is, solutions that take into account the greater good, uh, even if they involve harming one person or if they involve um, um, breaking a rule. Uh, that was kind of surprising. But so it, you're you're looking at what is the greatest good that you're wanting to see how to foster the maximum good for the maximum amount of people is that kind of the underlying uh, intention or yeah and I'm trying to find out what prevents people from from doing that uh huh and looking at what uh, what's inhibiting uh, that uh, greatest good for the greatest amount of people and, and that last study what was what was the component that was that you were finding I didn't quite follow that um, we, we gave people moral most of my work is with moral dilemmas uh -huh. like um, well one is vaccination uh, if, if there's, there's a vaccine that will there's an epidemic coming um, a vaccine will prevent the epidemic completely, but it has side effects that will lead to some deaths. So if the epidemic, if, if you're a public health official, if you give everybody the vaccine, um, 10 people will die uh, from the vaccine. If you give nobody the vaccine, 100 people mm -hmm. will die. Uh, 
should you give the vaccine? And uh, a lot of people say no, because then I would be causing the deaths. And in a sense, those they're sympathizing with the people who they directly affect through their action, but not the people that they affect would affect through their omission. And that's the sort of thing that I've been studying. And it seems that that we I mean, this is all very preliminary. But one question is, who is the sort of person who is more likely to 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 decide for the greater good? That is, give the vaccine, even though it's going to cause harm. And the uh, and to our surprise, we're finding that it might be people who are more capable of sympathy. But mm -hmm. I'm not, not sure. You know, mm -hmm. it's a preliminary. Uh, one th an interesting finding that was published recently is that people who do that are also more subject to anger. So, and I, I don't quite understand that. <laughs> uh, the people who are more subject to anger will want to more address uh, the greater good? Yes. Hmm. I, the only way I can understand it is through myself, uh -huh. which is that I'm very, the anger is my dominant emotion. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh -huh. Getting angry at people who do stupid things, who uh -huh. leave, leave money on the table, who fail to, to do something really easy that would help a lot of people. So... And, and of course, that's the main motivation of politics, actually. You know, you get angry at those bastards on the other side. Right. right. And, uh, so it's really, yeah, it's really about uh, feeling, you know, wanting kind of the maximum good. If you don't want the maximum good, I'm going to get angry at you, kind of like that. Because but, why aren't you wanting the maximum good for the maximum amount of people? It's really easy. Uh -huh. you know, there are a lot of things that are really easy that aren't being done. But, yeah. Well, the, the, you know, the way that um, that I'm looking at, for example, that, uh, uh, you know, the court case that you're talking about with the vaccine is for me, there was like a lack of empathy um, that the, uh, the the people who are making the judgment, they were maybe empathizing uh, with uh, the victim, but they weren't empathizing with uh, the manufacturer or empathizing with uh, people who would be affected. So for me, it's a very narrow empathy, and, and what I would want to do is w expand the empathy, that um, and that uh, retribution, in a sense, is actually an unempathic uh, position. So I completely agree, and I think Paul Bloom would be completely agree. Yeah, but except, I'm not sure that the emotional part of empathy is necessary to understand what brings about the greater good and act to, to do it. That is, the motivation can come from somewhere else. Anger. Or um, sort of a, a personal commitment. This is what I stand for. So, but, um, the, but it's about understanding and empathizing with the people that you're angry with. Right? It's like asking yeah. them, it's like, what, what's their position? Where are they coming from? And why are they coming from that position and, and empathizing with them and hearing, uh, you know, their, their views and putting that, ourselves that, in, in their shoes indeed, as well. That, that, that's, also, that's also important and it's very hard. So <laughs> I have a real problem with Boehner, you know, the Speaker of the House. Uh-huh. Well, when I, you know, when I walk through the living room here and I, I have like, you know, uh, Republicans, you know, talking, my, my partner, she starts railing at them and says, oh, the idiots the, and all that kind of stuff. She, and I said, no, you got to listen and really empathize and put yourself in, in their situation and understand where they're coming from. Uh, someone Absolutely. like Boehner to, uh, because we need to build a culture of empathy, you know, it's uh it's not, and it's also for me. It's not just empathizing with Boehner, but asking Boehner to empathize with others as well, and well, kind indeed. of expanding the empathy. And I agree, and it's and and I try to 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 put myself in the position of people who support, um, you know, you know, cutting the food stamp program and things like that. Um, and and I think I can sort of understand where they're coming from, but I mean, they, a lot of them think that. They're against the idea of forced charity. Um, I don't particularly see what's wrong with forced charity, um, um, but uh, you know, I try to understand that that point of view. And I think I sort of can. 
Well, mm-hmm. sometimes there's a need for kind of a dialogue to actually dialogue about it to really understand, um, you know, those points of view. My family is conservative, evangelical, uh, Republican, and, you know, I've had a lot of uh, conflicts with, with them, you know, around politics and kind of how to be in the world. And I've just found that now that I'm empathizing, just kind of hearing their point of view to see the underlying values and concerns and needs and you know aspirations that they have that it's it's really kind of bringing us closer together um well that's good <laughs> and uh the other thing i wanted to say is within that uh you know you're, you mentioned that something was within a court case i mean that the the very structure of the justice system seems to me a low empathy environment that it's kind of like framing the discussion uh in in terms of uh, you know punishment, in terms of competition, it's my side against your side, and you know it's two lawyers kind of battling it out. So the very structure of a court is is a very low, um, I mean, low empathy environment. I mean, it's it's uh, you know it's uh, more empathy maybe in it than a you know like a kangaroo court or something, but it, or a dictatorship, but. A real deep empathic uh, situation would be something along the lines of, you know, restorative justice or a restorative empathy uh, environment where like everybody's voice was heard and you kind of dialogue until there's a kind of a, a, a shared understanding and action, mm-hmm. empathic action emerges. Right. Uh, that, that's, uh, you know, that sounds good. I think there is some empathy, especially in criminal trials where the victims are usually brought the the uh, the prosecutor usually tries to get the jury or the judge to empathize with the victims and sometimes the defense tries to get them to empathize with the defendant As, you know this person came from a poor background and you, you know uh, all, all that sort of stuff mm-hmm. and, and also I, I also think sometimes we have to punish people uh-huh and you know, you you can empathize too. You parents often say to their children, "This hurts me more than it hurts you." <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you think that punishment is an important, uh, you know, factor in terms of uh, getting people. I don't know what to to uh, to follow the rules or to think about others or think about well, others' I, welfare. That they need that punishment to to do that. Yes. Uh huh. Uh-huh. That, that that is punishment works. Uh, we, there's some people who say it doesn't, but uh, my my favorite example. It's not a, a. There's some actually very good studies, but my favorite example is to contrast the do not call law in the United States and the can spam act. The can spam act has no teeth. As a result of that, about 80 percent of email is spam. The do not call law apparently has teeth. Uh, it, when that law was passed, the uh, number of junk phone calls decreased from about five per day to about one a year. <laughs> so that they do happen. But, uh, uh, so the threat of punishment does deter people from doing bad things. Yeah. Uh, well, in a sense, if we talk about the, you know, what the bad thing is in terms of the spam law, it would be not empathizing with the people that they're sending all that spam to. Well, they can't resist the temptation of making money. Right? So Yeah, uh, so it's kind of like their self-interest. It's like they have this it, self-interest, I want to make the money, and so isn't isn't the you know the doing the right thing in a sense would be empathizing with the people that you're affecting and in, in dealing with so it's well, kind of sure. like saying you know you're not empathizing you know with with people or we're going to have to punish you to make you behave because you have a lack of empathy or to we'll have to punish you to make sure that people like you in the future uh don't do this because if they do they know they're going to get caught and punished so it's, yeah, so it's, it's like the people yeah. who are thinking of not being empathic will kind of, I mean, that's how I kind of frame it, right? So people in the future who might be unempathic, thinking, even thinking of being unempathic, will be afraid and then not do the action that would, that would harm others or not can be considerate of others. So, 
not everyone is capable of empathy, it seems. Uh, there's a, you know, a, a dimension of individual differences called psychopathy. Mm -hmm. I guess you know this. <laughs> uh -huh. there, and at one extreme end are people who are called psychopaths. And they seem incapable of empathy, guilt, um, and, uh, and, other, and regret, and, and other, other emotions connected with morality. I'm not sure about anger. Uh, but they actually have low fear. They don't feel fear. I was just interviewing, did an interview uh, with someone at um, Georgetown University. She actually studies psychopathy, and she's saying that they actually don't feel fear, so the threat of punishment actually doesn't work very well because they well, don't it care. Does, <laughs> it does if they calculate their self-interest. And uh -huh. some are very okay. good at doing that. Uh -huh. So, you know, the... Uh, so there are always going to be people who cannot be educated to have sufficient empathy for others so that they do the right thing. And they need to be threatened with punishment. And if they're good at calculating what's good for them, then they won't do it. Uh -huh. Well, how, what do you think about the notion of building a culture of empathy, of deepening empathy within society and fostering it and making it a, a social value? That's kind of like the position I'm coming from is that, you know, we need to be uh, nurturing empathy, uh, you know, in our personal relationships and the schools and the environment and the, the different institutions we have. And, you know, we should be uh, doing what we can to uh, nurture that and foster that and deepen it. I'm, I'm not sure it's possible. Uh, huh. I, I, ha I don't know any research, and you must have talked to people who, who have done research, but I would think that trying to change people's emotional makeup is difficult. And, but I think there's something else you can do that I'm sure will work, although I don't know any research on it either, which is to teach people to understand in a intellectual way, what it's like to be very different, what to be very different, and and get to, and you can do that through literature, um, movies, and and also certain fields of studies like like um, social anthropology, where you know like, I think it should almost be required in elementary school that uh, that people learn about other cultures, and. Learn really what it's like to be inside those cultures, I mean, to uh, so that you know the great variety of, of human experience and, and human capacity, mm -hmm. and you know that people are not always like you. Because mm -hmm. one of the big mistakes is thinking other people are just like me, and they're not. Okay. So it sounds like you're a little skeptical that people can change. That you know they tend to be you know we are kind of how we are. And that, but there are some things that could be maybe done in terms of teaching about other cultures. So there are some things that can be done, like yeah. teaching about other cultures, maybe in the schools, you start learning about other cultures, uh, maybe through literature, you can read literature and kind of Im learn about other, how other people see the world. So there, there does seem to be some things that you're seeing that can, can be done to kind of yes. deepen that uh, uh, empathy and understanding. Now, maybe the emotions can be taught, too. I don't know. I, I, I sort of am I'm not sure how. Um, but what I think tends, what, what I worry about is how do you assess that? How, how do you, and what, what's possible is that if school children are encouraged to have emotions, what they'll actually learn is how to fake emotions. Um, so... Uh -huh. So how, if you have empathy, how can you have like an authentic empathy instead of like a fake and, uh, right. you know, uh, uh, yeah, a fake empathy that's just a, a manipulative kind of a ploy or something like that, maybe? Yes. Is that what you mean? Uh -huh. That's what I worry about. I, and I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, how about your own situation with uh, empathy? How, how, what's been your experience? Uh, uh I mean, I, 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 again, I, I don't think I'm real high on the empathy scale. <laughs> no one is. Uh, I feel it sometimes, but it's not a common emotion. Uh -huh. But I still think I um, live a pretty moral life on the whole, not completely, but um, 
and I do that by trying to make good decisions, mm -hmm. when, especially when other people are involved. Well, what I'm hearing there is that kind of personally, you're kind of wondering about your own empathy that maybe you're, you don't feel like you're very empathic, but that you have a morality in the sense that you're trying to do what's right with people. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and understand them from their point of view. And I, and I can do that without feeling much emotion, although, you know, it would, um, I, I, I really, although I don't really know how much other people feel. I, I, it's hard for me to... Um, compare myself to others because I don't have their experience that well. So. Well, it sounds like you're wanting to contribute to the well-being of others and take into consideration, you know, what their, what's going on for them and have that kind of their well-being in mind. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I don't give to beggars. <laughs> Well, you know, just giving to beggars, I don't uh, do much of that myself either, but it, I don't see that that's necessarily empathy. No, but You but know, that... it's it's more like, um, I mean, there's also a sense of empathizing with oneself in, in terms of holding one's own, uh, you know, holding one, one's own humanity also as as part of the, the mix, you know, so that we hold our, for at least that's where I come from, is that my hum I look at my own humanity as well as the others, and you know mine is is uh, kind of valuable or important too. So I want to hold everyone's humanity. And uh, giving to a beggar isn't necessarily uh, empathic. It seems to me it could be you know done out of guilt or um, right. you know or uh, you know, sometimes maybe just being there and being present with, with the person and just hearing their story or something could be, you know, much more empathic than the notion of giving to someone in kind of a detached, guilty way. Or... Yep. So, uh, so the, anyway, I think I need to go soon. So do you okay. have any other final things you want to bring up? Um, the one thing was uh, when I talked to Ilana, she talked about the identifiable victim uh, yes. effect was that uh, something you had uh, addressed uh, she she was saying that she said regarding Paul Bloom's reference to our work I think it was quite accurate I share his view that while empathy certainly has an important role it is highly susceptible to bias and should not serve as a basis for public policy that was kind of where she was coming from I completely agree with that and and her work is very relevant to that and the work on the identifiable victim effect is is hers and um, and Tehila Kogut, her collaborator, and also um, my, my colleague Deborah Small. Uh, so th that is, there's a, a line of work on, on that effect, and those three people have pretty much done it all. Mm, mm -hmm. and, um, and and oh, the yeah, and and also the other person who's been interested in it is Paul Slovic and and his group. Oh. oh, probably interviewed him, too. I haven't yet, but I do want to. I'm going through all the different people and mentioned in Paul's article and kind of interviewing them and kind of just building kind of uh, my understanding of what trying to empathize with uh, Paul Bloom and his uh, point of view, and um, then also kind of advocate for you know for kind of my point of view is that we need to be fostering empathy and deepening empathy and. Um, well, it'd be great if, if someone could figure out how to do that in ways that works. Uh -huh. and, and that doesn't just focus people on, on whoever is right in front of them. Right. Uh -huh. Well, that's that imaginative empathy or that extended empathy that we can uh, connect with uh, people all over the world and in the future. And we even can empathize with our own selves in the future, it seems to me, kind of through yes. this extended empathy that it, we indeed, can... Indeed, that's a very interesting point about empathizing with your own self in your future. Uh, there's some philosophers and others who have argued that, that caring about yourself in the future is philosophically and maybe psychologically similar to caring about other people. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, so that when someone, when a young person takes up smoking, what that mm -hmm. person has to think about mm -hmm. is what that's going to do to the to the person who will inhabit his body in 40 years. 
Wow, I'd never thought of that. That's like a form of, that's like you could frame it as a way, a, self, a lack of self-empathy in Indeed. that sense. Yeah, that's that's a great, I'm going to use that concept. <laughs> I, I really, I really like that one. <laughs> well, great. Well, this is a, is there any final thoughts you have? Um, no, nope. this okay. was interesting. Okay. Yeah, well, it was a lot thanks of fun. So uh, thanks for taking the time. And um, yeah, I hope to you know, stay in contact. This will be on the web in you know, a couple of days. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, John. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.